fresh from being Cashman Bastillion West, which was a folk trio. Terry Cashman, one of the members, having written Sunday Will Never Be the Same with Gene Pastilli. Tommy West joins that little troupe. But that's when they started recording as a trio. They, they did uh, a few albums together. Wes Farrell comes into the mix because Gene Pastilli, after recording a project called the Buchanan Brothers, where they had the hit Medicine Man, and they had Son of a Lovin' Man, which appeared mysteriously. It was like a minor hit, and it appeared mysteriously in a Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Literally out of nowhere, it's like, what is that doing in there? And I remember watching the movie. I had no idea that was going to be in there. And then suddenly there it is. Quite a deal. But after the Buchanan brothers, G, uh, Gene left. And basically it was Tommy West, or Tommy Picardo is his name, and uh, Terry Cashman, Dennis Minogue. They hooked up with Wes Farrell who produced them as a group called Central Park West or CPW. And that's how Wes got, in, got involved initially with uh, Cashman West. Uh, they were the first ones to record Candida, by the way. Uh, it was never released, but Wes did do that song with them. Anyway, so then when he got the assignment for the Partridge Family, he ended up bringing in writers and songwriters and people that he'd worked with. And Cashman and West were a couple of them also. All right, here's one story. I'm not going to bore everybody with all these. Uh, there are just a billion stories from that era as a kid. But there's this one, this one thing that's kind of important, which is I would get the release information. By that point, after the first two albums were out, Sound Magazine hadn't come out yet. In fact, they were still kind of figuring out where that track list was going to land. I was calling Arista, and Arista referred me back to, they didn't want to really, they weren't giving me the track list. So I was determined to get the, that darn track list. So I called Screen Gems. I thought, hmm, maybe I could weasel, weasel it out of them. And I did. Erwin Schuster was somebody, uh, the publisher over there, who I frequently spoke to. But Erwin was wonderful. And Erwin would get on the phone once in a while with me. And he gave me the track list for the initial sound magazine. You know, just so people know, uh, Whale Song was originally on that initial track list. And so was Cashman and West's It's Time That I Knew You Better. Come On Love was supposed to be on that album also. So I went to Cashman and West. I called Norma. And I said, I've got the list for the, for the new album and, you know, to Dennis and Tommy's a song are on it. So she was like, oh, that's wonderful and all that. I went to school with Joe, uh, Joey D'Imperio. Joe D'Imperio was an A&R guy over at RCA Records. He, he was pals. They all were pals with each other. He was pals with Wes Farrell. He was pals with, but Joe, I remember at one point told me, having a conversation with him, I said, yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is great. There's, a, you know, Shirley, Shirley Jones, uh, the whale song is going to be on there. And he said, no, it's not going to be on there. And I said, what, what do you mean? And he said, I had a conversation with Wes and he was asking, he was basically, I guess, asking around for advice as far as whether he should put a song with Shirley on that album or not. Joe explained the focus is on David. So the, it's not really having Shirley on there would have been distracting. So he gave the advice. He was one of the people who gave the advice. Yeah, don't include that because you'll confuse the audience. You know, think about those days. It's all about marketing. Joe was a very good man. Yeah, I mean, he didn't do anything bad here. All he did was give his expert advice as far as if you're going to focus on David, <laughs> who's right here. Um, uh, you know, then uh, then you can't do that. That's the sidebar. Where do you rate the Sound Magazine album? Oh, that's my favorite one. Yeah, What's sonically, it? every song on there to me is perfect. I think that that's a perfect sequence. I think that that's a marvelous album. I think that they knew they had a hit with the first two albums. I think they knew they had a hit with those first, with a hit group with the first two albums and they didn't want to blow it. So they really wanted to make that. Those two albums in a lot of ways seem to me like how can we make the songs on the television show the best they can sound, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas they knew then they had a star with David Cassidy and then all of a sudden Sound Magazine, right? And then with Sound Magazine, they started, West started to approach those recordings differently. And also that overlapped, as in let's make a real album that can overlap a lot of stuff. When you hear stuff like uh, I'm on my way back home, Summer Days, which of course everybody knows was recorded on Partridge Family Dime, but was supposed to have been a David Cassidy single. Um, and then they found out about it and was like, hey, wait a minute, that's a Partridge Family song. You get that back in the Partridge Family um, uh, catalog. That's a great album. To me, that's one of, one of the great pop albums of all time. Uh, seriously, go from song to song to song. It's like there's no weak moment. Are you aware of any unreleased Partridge Family tracks that nobody is aware of? I think it's pretty much been covered because everybody has done a really, a, a, has done really good detective work on that. Between, between Lisa Sutton, you guys, everybody who contributed, it seems like to, the, to your book, it seems like the hunting, and I think there were people behind the scenes who were also acknowledging what that stuff was. I don't know how much of the Cherish album 
um, or the Sound Magazine album crossover as far as tracks. My theory is that a lot of that, because those are so well manicured, well textured, pretty well produced, super produced albums, is that there was there's material there, and I'll bet you not filed under Partridge Family, but maybe under David Cassidy. I'll bet you there's some stuff hiding that has not been unearthed. Although, like I said, I don't know for sure, but I'll bet you there are some titles in there that that uh, uh, that are not so much not so much leftovers from the Cherish album but stuff that got lost in the mix between the two albums, where at least there are basic tracks where David is singing over a track where they were trying stuff out. I'll bet you that stuff is still around. But other than that, no, I don't know. You're the one who enlightened me about the RCA, uh, I'm not about the, uh, the leftover tracks from um, uh, Dreams of Nothing More uh, album. But as far as the unreleased material from the Partridge family, there are songs on there. Let's be, let's be honest about the quality of, a, of some of those things. I, when I was a kid, I loved the love song. Oh, then you don't believe in love songs. I loved that song. And it's very humble. It's very cool. But in comparison to what came out, let's say, on the first two albums, what would you have taken off in order to put the love song on there? There needed to have been a third album. I mean, seriously, probably from between the first year and the second year. Songs, songs that I would have focused on, definitely It's Time That I Knew You Better, which did end up on a, on a rarities, uh, David Cassidy's Partridge Family Favorites. It ended up on that. But Sunshine Eyes, Another Cashman and West song, but Sunshine Eyes was a great recording. Uh, it was very fully orchestrated and full and well, you know, well produced. I don't know why that never came out. God bless you, girl. But um, God bless you, girl is another song where the feel is perfect. Feel is great. That's a great recording. Except that they wanted to leave the God aspect out, so they were a little too, you know, yeah, afraid of that. Plus, also I think Listen to the Sound, John Hill's Listen to the Sound, was supposed to. Well, I think it was pitched as a theme song for the series. I think Listen to the Sound was something he pitched for the second season. You know, and then there were those stray, the stray things which fall into the, is it a David Cassidy demo or is it a Partridge Family, you know, song like, um, what is that rocker? Uh, Warm My Soul that he recorded later for his second album. It's like another, there's a lot of the gray area of whether that was truly recorded for the Partridge Family that they took a pitch. It sounds like the Partridge Family as far as background vocals. It sounds like it's something that could have gone on uh, maybe the second album. Again, it, it, there's a lot of loose categorizing that happened with some of those recordings. Then I mean, there was also a recording that we know he did of I'll Be Your Magician. Yeah. I heard Danny that. put on to his solo album. <laughs> and another song as well, you know, in the first season, To Be Lovers, where we just have David's vocals yeah. halfway through the song. Did yeah. he ever record the full song? It makes sense. He would have. Yeah, and the other one on the road, where there's a full take on him. We know. We know that, as you say, we know that exists. L I know, but listen to that vocal. I mean, on it. But that's not the one we would have wanted. Um, the, the one that that's on the record, I think, is. And I think on the road was pitched by Barry Mann and Cynthia Wilde for the uh, for as a theme song also for the series. I mean, listen. Look at the lyrics on that. You told me that you'd produced a box set with Rupert Holmes. I just wonder if he, if he ever spoke to you about how he wrote Echo Valley and yeah, what he, he, he David's yes. interpretation of his song. He loved the interpretation, loved it, loved it. Rupert loves it. Rupert, Rupert is nothing but positive. And it explains why Barbara Streisand would have wanted him to, you know, work with her on her uh, Butterfly album and to Star is Born and stuff like that. He's been, he has his tentacles and everything. He was a uh, mystery of Edwin Drood, um, oh, other musicals, Curtains. He's done, he's been associated with so many things, so many, and a couple of books. I'll go to Echo Valley 26809 in a second, but I want to give you just how intense this guy was. Epic signed him. Echo had something to do with it. Like, his name started to get around, and I think Echo Valley 26809 was was known by a lot of people. So you're never going to get people to admit that they loved the Partridge family then, whenever. But Sound Magazine, I'm imagining, made its rounds, and a lot of people knew what that record was. I believe it maybe contributed if it weren't one of the factors, um, if it weren't the main factor, rather, which I, I doubt it was. But he got a deal that Epic, widescreen was the name of the album, an amazing album for the time. It was a concept album based on media, uh, based on movies, television, anything that had to, story, storytelling. And they were all like basically scripts. All the songs were scripts to things that would have happened in bittersweet movies or, you know, whatever. And, and Barbara recorded three songs from that album on her Butterfly, uh, on her Butterfly album. He was intense. He was really great. And he had a string of albums. On the box set that I did with him, years later, I met Universal. And I reached out to him because we had at Universal, we owned four of his albums, three of his albums, three of his albums. So I reached out to him and I said, how about a box of Thane Tierney, who was my 
cohort, he was running a little licensing within the division label called Hippo. But the Rupert Holmes project, he loved because he loved Rupert. And he made it happen. He just made it happen. But we got all of his albums together on this box set. Uh, there was a disc of demos and B-sides and stuff, an additional disc. So it was four CDs of two albums each of his eight albums, right? And then the, four, the fifth album, the fifth CD rather, was of the of unreleased material. Uh, for instance, the demos he pitched Barbara for A Star Is Born, songs that never made it into that. The original versions of the Pina Colada song and things, you know, early versions of those. He recorded three songs for that, three originals for that. One was Echo Valley 26809. It was a really sweet version. It, this, these are the last recordings that I think he did were the three that he did for, my, for, the, for the box set. He really liked David's version of Echo Valley 26809. Was it his emotional delivery of it? He, he basically let me know how much he liked it, that he, it was like a really, he really liked it. But knowing Rupert, I'm imagining, I'll put words in his mouth, um, <clears throat> it, it, I'm imagining that it was because it was, it was an exact record. It was, a, it was the perfect pop record. And it should have been a single. And I think that it's been included on virtually everything when they do compilations. They always include Echo Valley 26809 on there. Yes. It's just such a loved song. And everybody knows that. If you say Echo Valley, they'll fill in 26809. Yes. A lot of people know that. And they don't. some of them don't even know why they know that. Well, how so many officers today them. just dialed that number? <laughs> yeah, the poor person on the other end of that. Oh, my God. I don't want to own that number. <laughs> especially back then they had to have tested it they had to have either claimed the number or tested it they couldn't subject somebody to that louise are you revealing that you called that number i am guilty sir oh nice that's great that's a great story <laughs> one real quick thing about that love is all i ever needed i walked into uh, oh god and it's bob hillman is connected to this and my old musical partner is connected to this Years and years and years later, now we're talking about, I guess, the 90s, maybe around 97. There was a place called the Sidewalk Cafe, still is, I think, in the city, uh, in the village. My old musical partner, Steve Mosto, who I had a group called the Almost Brothers with, and I, I, he's a frequent co-writer with me, songwriter. He was playing on his own, and I went to go see him. He did great. He had his own audience. Right after him was a guy named Bob Hillman. We were packing up. I was helping Steve leave, and Bob set up. And it was just him and I think an acoustic guitar. I think that was really it. He was amazing. And then from, and from that time, I was working at Razor and Tie, who, by the way, we had reissued the Partridge Family re, uh, you know, album, some of them, uh, just to complete the, the Sound Magazine story. I know these stories are long and I apologize totally. It's just that I'm in the moment as I'm telling these stories. I know, um, I after Bob, I made friends with him and I later worked with him and I hooked him up with Tommy West to produce his records. Uh, I did his first demos with him and then he went on to Cashman, Cashman West. He went on to Tommy to, to who ended up producing him. But love is all I ever needed. That's where I'm heading. Okay. So lo love it. So the guy, I'm now like making friends with Bob and we're leaving. I'm walking him out of the place and all of a sudden I hear da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. And I'm like, wait a minute, I know that song. Is that the is, uh, is that on Muzak? Oh, that's cool. I gotta go tell the you know, sidewalk cafe people that's cool to play Partridge Family on Muzak. And I go in there. There's this guy sitting at piano playing Love is All I Ever Needed. So it was the trifecta that night. It was like, what the heck? It was like, how cosmic is this? So, it, and he did a great version. And then I went to him and I said, that is a great David Cassidy song. What, you know, how did you, how did you discover it? And he kind of didn't want to talk about it. He didn't want to talk about how, you know, it was sort of like in his mind, I guess, it still was uncool or whatever, uh, where, however, whatever it was, but he didn't want to talk about it being a David Cassidy song. Perfect album. I think it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, if there isn't, if it isn't a 10, it's a 9.99. I mean, for him to have written that at such a young age. I think David had a depth beyond what a, what a, a I'll say kid, why not? A kid his age would have had, uh, had to have had. He saw it all also. You know, figure with a person, with a kid's brain development, myelination doesn't stop until 25. He's in the process of still having connections make and, and uh, get gotten rid of where, you know, the, that little box of connections is making, making, looking at the world and going, oh, this is how it works in order to survive in the world. Okay. So all of the, all the awful stuff that I think that he was going through made him, my, my point is it, it made him more mature. And I guess it, it also separated him from a lot of the, a lot of his contemporaries. And it, just in the general sense, where do you go after being the biggest, bigger than Elvis and bigger than the Beatles in the world? Where do you go after that? And having that sort of I'm not good enough thing going on, you know, trying to please dad, 
Maybe not so much trying to please dad. I'm thinking years later, not looking at this, I'm going, maybe not so much to please dad, but to get the acceptance from someone who he didn't have. There was no one in, um, I believe, there was no one in his life he could have gotten the, the acceptance from that would have made him feel complete, like, yes, I'm a good person, I finally did it. There were people in his life that did that, but there was nobody who did the foundation, who, to, who put in the circuitry into his system that made him feel like, I'm a, you know what, I am pretty talented, I am a, a pretty good guy, without, e you know, without egomaniacal. You know. It's having that self-belief that you are good enough. I mean, if people tell you on a regular basis that you're no good, eventually right. you're going to start to believe them. Right. And he knew um, he was, he wanted to be, and he wanted to be hip, right? Yeah. He wanted to be accepted by that crowd because he really loves that kind of music. He loved rock music over CC Ryder on his live album. And he's doing those kind of songs. That's where his heart is. But he's, but you know, he's working overtime, having to do a lot of pop stuff that he doesn't have to, that he has to crank out and have no relationship with over the Partridge family years. I mean, he did good performances in a lot of the first, I, th I believe the first at least two years of that material, he was having some connection with. And then I think after that, some of that, a lot of that stuff was phoned in because of his relationship with Wes. But even the relationship with Wes, that could have helped. You know what I mean? There were people in his life where it could have been like, not that Wes exploited him, but it could have been people in his life where he was perceiving they don't want something out of me. Yeah. And, and they're letting me, they're giving me what I need spiritually, psychologically, and, and love. And I don't, I'm not sure he ever got that. The David Cassidy Connections with Louise Poynton. Do you consider his RCA work his best work? Yes. Uh, well, Cherish album, How Do You Beat That? That's another amazing album. That Cherish album, every single, for me, every single song on that, it's like the companion to, uh, to Sound Magazine. So yeah. I believe from, a, from an extension, he's reading those songs like they're his songs. I believe probably it was because he was so happy to have done his first album. You know, this is me separate from the Partridge family. So here's how I am. And then the 